So let's kind of jump right in. Um, could you kind of kick us off and, and describe what Kazveen was like and what your family's, uh, kind of where you lived and what you were surrounded by? Yes. First of all, good evening. And I'm so glad to be back at the Hirshhorn and to say goodbye to this exhibition. I feel very emotional as I really have um, enjoyed this exhibition. And for me, it was perhaps the most significant exhibition I've ever had, thanks to Melissa Ho and Melissa Chu. Um, and to just give you a little background, um, I think Kazvin is perhaps the third or the fourth most religious city in the country. Uh, so religion played a big part in my, um, you know, my life in the early years. Um, although my family were not so religious, um, but the city was very religious. Um, and and also, um, it was a very conservative city. Um, so I had no um, knowledge what was going on in Tehran at the time, which was completely opposite to Ghazvin. Later on, when I was here, I discovered that there was actually a very active cultural life in Tehran, uh, in the visual arts, in literature, in film. I had no clue. I had never entered an art museum or never studied art, and no one in my family or remote family ever were artistically inclined. So I have no idea why I became an artist. And all I remember was um, that at my little you know, school that I went, they called me the artist because I did graffiti on the walls. Um, but, but to be honest, I, my education was primitive, and, but I had a very loving family, and I remember very specifically um, the house that I lived in. Uh, it, it always, to me, has a reminiscence of the Persian miniature paintings uh, in a way that it was very symmetrical with the garden and the, the willow trees, and it was very beautiful. And so uh, it was a very simple house, but for me, it was our little oasis. And uh, so that's about it. And if it. I remember correctly, your family owned some orchards, some uh, fruit yes. orchards? My father uh, was a farmer as well as a doctor. And so uh, in, in Ghazvin, he, he actually produced fruit and everything. So I spent a lot of time in the orchard. And uh, another thing, I, I, it's very odd because I think uh, you forget some uh, places and spaces, but you never forget the odors of certain things, like the spring in Asvin when my father's orchard blossomed. Uh, I always get very nostalgic uh, about that more than anything. And so, yeah, and it was not the most beautiful city at all. It was, in fact, uh, not a very attractive city, but still, I liked it. It's northwest of Tehran, um, along the mountains that separate Iran, or the inland Iran from the Caspian Sea. I, I brought up the orchards um, because, Nazila, you have... Um, oh, let me, let me clean up one more thing. So, Shireen, what happened to your family's home and orchards um, after the revolution? Um, well, um, the family moved to Tehran, um, Mainly, um, there was this whole fascination with moving into apartments in Tehran for a lot of people. Um, but I think for my father, uh, as he, get, um, he got older and after the revolution, um, a lot of his farm was, uh, farm was confiscated. And um, he wasn't practicing anymore. And uh, he was a very respected doc physician who started the first hospital in the city of Ghazvin. But I think he was um, quite stressed uh, after the revolution. And um, he was very much in despair. And he left Ghazvin. And they moved to a very unattractive apartment in Tehran, which was a very big disappointed, dis disappointment. And when I went back to Ghazvin the last time, and they destroyed the house and built many apartments, unfortunately. So, Nazila, you have kind of, in some ways, an opposite experience. You grew up in Tehran. And, and um, how and where did you grow up in the city? Um, and then later, how did orchards happen to come into your life? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have a lot in common with um, Shireen, actually. Orchard, um, and 
the sort of eastern part of the country. My, my father is from Azerbaijan. So people in Azerbaijan uh, speak also Turkish, and some people, almost half of the population in Ghazbin speak Turkish. So we have two other issues in common. Uh, my father was a bureaucrat, worked for the government before the revolution, and at the time of the 1979 revolution, he was quite a senior um, official with the Ministry of Power. Uh, my family never supported Khomeini, never supported the revolution altogether. So when the Shah left and the revolutionaries came to power, uh, my father was singled out very early on, and he was fired. He lost his job. And uh, that was the only thing he had done most of his uh, life, worked for the government. Uh, and by that time, that was the only thing he knew. So after he lost his job, there wasn't much that he couldn't do. We, he needed to earn a living. So he turned to an orchard we owned in, in Azerbaijan. He had inherited from his father and started driving 400 miles um, to, to the city uh, called Tabriz to, to work on the farm. Uh, so from being um, a senior bureaucrat before the revolution, uh, he turned into a farmer after the revolution. I, I was a girl from the capital. I, I was born um, outside Tehran, but I had spent most of my life in Tehran, except for a few years that my family had lived in London. Uh, and uh, I was eight years old at the time of the revolution. We, we lived in a middle-class neighborhood where a lot of my parents' friends supported the revolution, but they supported the revolution many different ways. A lot of them were socialists. A lot of them were anti-Shah, but none of them supported Khomeini. Um, so um, I, I come from um, a generation that remembers opposition to the Shah, uh, but not in the same sense that things turned out after the revolution. Uh, my parents and their friends never thought that there would be an Islamic regime that would come to power after the revolution. One of the little kind of things that struck me that you might also have sort of in common in a backwards way around that time is that um, your housekeeper's daughter um, received a two-bedroom apartment from the regime in the mid-80s, and it was kind of part of, I guess, this land dis redistribution from, from wealthier middle-class Iranians to the regime's supporters. Yeah, after the revolution, one of the promises that the revolution kept was to help uh, its supporters, those who had supported uh, Khomeini, and most of them were from the lower classes. A lot of them, uh, their parents were from the rural areas, or they had uh, migrated to the city. Uh, they were not rural anymore. They lived in the urban areas, but they were very poor. And our, our maid uh, was very poor. We had visited her home a couple of times, uh, taken food for, for her family. She was a mother of uh, uh, five or six children, uh, each child was from a different husband. She was not very lucky. So she was a single mother. Uh, but her uh, eldest uh, daughter, she had uh, joined the local mosque, uh, become a revolutionary. And after the victory of the revolution, she got a job. She got a job with the government. She became the principal of a school. And probably as reward for her contributions or because she, she held a senior position, uh, she was given an apartment near Tehran. In those days, that area was still the suburbs. Uh, I don't know exactly whether the land for those apartments were taken away for people or that was part of the housing. Uh, that was, uh, that, 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 that the construction started before the revolution. But yes, a lot of land, a lot of uh, houses were taken away uh, from people who were somehow affiliated to the regime before the Shah or they were well off, and they were given to people who supported Khomeini. So before getting into some of the broader questions of, of gender and sociopolitics in Iran, I wanted to try to set up that kind of both of you and your families had been um, really directly impacted by the revolution. Um, and before kind of, I guess, getting into both of your work, um, Nazila, could you talk a little bit about how revolutionary clerics 
valued the life of women vis-a-vis -vis the life of a man um, and how that evolved a little bit over the course of maybe the first 15 or 20 years of the revolution? Uh, well, this was not the opinion of the clerics. This is uh, part of uh, uh, Islamic law, what they call Sharia. And the value of a woman's life is worth half the value of a man's life. Uh, this is true about the value of uh, uh, non-Muslims' lives, uh, the value of uh, even a male uh, Christian is worth half the life of a Muslim man. Uh, so there were many cases uh, that this became very controversial. Uh, there were uh, crimes happening in the country. People were becoming angry and involved women. I remember that there was uh, a young girl, mm, at, at 15 years old. Actually, her name, I remember her name well because she had the same family name as I. Her name was Leila Fati. She had been kidnapped, raped, and then murdered uh, by four men. Uh, and, and so, but the, the value of her life was almost uh, worth one-eighth uh, of the value of the lives of the men. So if her family wanted to have uh, the men punished, they had to pay blood money to the families of the four men. And a lot of people came out, a lot of activists, and they started arguing that this is, in a way, rewarding the families of these men. And so the government had to step in pay the money itself, pay what was called blood money to the family so that it could punish the men. Uh, unfortunately, the, the law hasn't changed. The law is still the same. Uh, in some cases that become, uh, it, the, the cases become very radical or controversial, the government steps in again and pays uh, the blood money so that um, the culprits could be punished. But uh, it hasn't changed. It's still the law. The only thing that changed was uh, the, the law regarding the value of uh, the, the life of non-Muslims. That was because of the work that, that their representatives in parliament did, and that changed. So Shireen, you start making art in uh, the 1990s. Um, you're, you're done at Berkeley, you have a nonprofit career, you start, you start making work. And in, in, in the works in the show, whether it's Women of Allah or, or the kind of the, the first three big video pieces, Turbulent, Rapture, and, and Fervor, um, women are either the protagonists or, at the very least, um, the protagonists are half women and half men. How aware, I mean, obviously you're aware of it, how important is it to you to provide a counter to that narrative? Well, I just want to take a step back because we were talking about um, our attachment to orchards and and then we were talking about um, how after the revolution so many families were impacted by the government. And just as a metaphor, um, my father, uh, he never made much money from his agriculture, but he loved his farm and he grew this oasis. And after the revolution, they started to give him a hard time and say that this land actually belonged previously to the pe people who was Haruti from related to the Shah. So they started to cut off the water to the orchard and the trees started to die. And and he started to, then they started to take part of the the land and then they said the animals had to be taken away because the city is expanding so they started to you know get rid of the animals and slowly the orchard started to shrink and shrink and my father uh, was very very upset and he was fighting all the time to take back the water and the land and eventually he died my brother uh, took over and unfortunately he he died then my sister who had no no legal experience she never even worked in her life she decided because she was the we only were women at this point all the men had died uh, well at least the ones in iran and so she fought with the government and and just recently she was able to reclaim the land and and that was to me uh, a very strong feminist position for someone who who never had any legal experience she went every day to the city of Ghazvin to the the you know to the government to the office of whatever and he re she reclaimed the land and i was extremely proud of her um and i think this kind of um this this kind of spirit uh, is what i i have been inspired by 
And, you know, I was thinking a lot about Nazila because I know her through her journalism for the New York Times. And I kept reading it when I was in New York. And I kept thinking, that's amazing. How does she do it? How does she live in Iran and still report um, in the New York Times? And, uh, or or the, the, the novelist and, and, and other female people. Be, uh, you know, women in Iran that have been very, very inspirational for me. So I think in, in many ways, of course, I'm a woman of fiction, but the spirit of the woman that I characterize are really, truly capture that spirit of resistance and, and defiance in the face of tyranny. And, and it's true that um, it's been extremely discriminative against women, but I think to some degree in the West as well. I mean, but I think just being a woman, we are usually find ourselves against the wall. So being an Iranian, of course, I've really focused on being an Iranian woman, but in the realm of fiction. But it's all due to the inspiration that I've taken in from women such as herself and many others. Is... I think pretty much every work of yours, but maybe one, um, has a woman as a protagonist, and there's never kind of a drop below a 50-50 men and women sharing the action, if you will. Um, so that must have been a decision you made right away, 1997-ish, I mean, at the very beginning of when you're making work. Well, I am a woman, um, and, and I, I feel that um, I can understand and express the emotions and the, the plight of a woman much better than a man. Uh, and I, I, I don't think that necessarily makes me a feminist. Uh, it's more also about the fact that um, in in very indirect way, all the characters, all the protagonists are an extension of who I am. Uh, even the narratives or the yeah the focus of my concepts are about issues that I have very personally experienced. So I think in many ways, in a fictionalized way, I I sort of re portray myself in ways and and try to look for certain resolutions and um, and and that really is the best explanation I can give. I'm not a man and I wouldn't even know what it's like to be a man and live in this planet, but I think I do have a pretty good idea of what it's like to be an Iranian woman and and, and uh, my most existential uh, issues as a woman in this world. So, uh, you know, I, I just want to be as, as honest as I can be with my subjects. When, when you started making video pieces, you'd been in the U.S. for almost 20 years. Um, how did you stay up to date or informed about uh, the experience and experiences of women back home? Uh, it's a very good question because tonight I was um, thinking, oh my God, I'm, you know, I've lived in this country now longer than I have lived in Iran. And here I'm sitting next to Nazila, who is most informed about what has happened in Iran since the revolution. Of course, I'm older than her. Um, but but the, the issue is that, um, you know, my relationship to Iran has been uh, very solid, but from a distance, and I have gone to Iran several times, and I am living with an Iranian community. I work entirely with the Iranian team, uh, most of whom have been very, same generation as me, very involved with the Islamic Revolution, have been in prison. Um, so we are um, very um, invested in the current and past um, historical situation of Iran, but, but a lot of them go back to Iran, but I don't. So so um, I want to always be very clear about that because uh, it's very, very wrong image to portray as someone who is an expert, who is very informed um, about the reality of Iranian situation. Um, and I, I think my work is purely an imagination of an artist who has lived uh, always uh, on in, in distance. And my perspective is a perspective of, uh, of an Iranian who 
has viewed history most of the time uh, as, a, as a form of fiction because you've never been in it yourself. Um, but, uh, um, but very much a part of it, even though you're not there. They, there's an expression, they say, uh, you can take an Iranian out of Iran, but you can never take Iran out of an Iranian. And um, and my situation politically and life in exile has has forced me to be living in a distance, but uh, I feel perfectly allowed to be able to um, delve into um, sociopolitical situations of Iran, um, but mine would be obvious in a more allegorical and fictionalized way. Uh, and I can interpret history in the way that I, I, I give myself the license to. But it's very different than um, Nazila, who has really lived it and is reporting on it. And, and um, so I just think that's the truth. When, when I first started looking at Shireen's work 15 years ago, um, one of the things that prompted in me was wanting to find out more about Iran, which I had and have never been to. And so I started reading um, whatever books I could find about contemporary Iran. One was um, your colleague Elaine Chalino's The Persian Mirrors, um, which is uh, a memoir of an American's experience in Iran, published in 2000-ish, fantastic. Um, and I found that the more I read about contemporary Iran, the more I understood or felt I could begin to understand things I was seeing in Shireen's work. And Nazila, as I read your memoir, um, I kept, you know, about every seven pages or so, I kept going, oh, that makes sense from that, that, that work, and that makes sense in that photograph. And so I wanted to try to pull a couple of those, those out to give people an idea of, of how the experience of, of, of reading a journalist's memoir could inform the experience of seeing Shireen's work and, and vice versa. Um, we were talking about your housekeeper a moment ago. Um, and I guess her daughter started attending Friday prayers at Tehran University once the revolution happened? She did too. Oh, she did too? She did. Could, you, could you kind of tell us, a, maybe set that scene and, and what happened at, at those Friday prayers and how was it kind of set up, men, women? So I can tell you, um, the only reason I know how the setup was because I ended up going to the Friday <laughs> prayers as a journalist years later. But when I was a child, the only thing I knew about the Friday prayers was her accounts telling us. And of course, in a few years' time, uh, one of our teachers at school required us to listen to the Friday prayers. And of course, I just, and, and summarize what the Friday prayer leader was talking about. And of course, I just listened to it for two minutes. My father listened to the rest of it, and he dictated the summary to me. It was too boring for me to listen to. <laughs> Uh, but the way Nessa, our, our maid, told us about the Friday prayers, it sounded like something absolutely fun. That's why I, I started listening to the, to the uh, uh, broadcast on, on radio and television quite excitedly. I mean, she lived in the suburbs. Uh, she had at least three or four kids at home. Uh, and they were spending most of their time in their tiny, tiny room. And they weren't going anywhere because she couldn't afford to take them anywhere. So she announced to us one day happily that she has started taking a bus that takes her and a lot of other people in her neighborhood to the Friday prayers for free. She said they go there, uh, they sit in the campus of Tehran University, uh, the kids have space to play, to run around. Uh, she takes snacks and sits with the other women and chit-chat. Uh, that was what I had um, envisioned. But of course, what we heard on, on, on the radio and what was broadcast on TV was totally different. It was a big podium where the Friday leader stood, always a cleric, holding a rifle. I had learned at school that the Friday leader always held a rifle to show to the enemy that the cleric is ready to, to defend uh, his beliefs. Um, uh, and then he, had, he, he made two sermons. The first one was religious. The second was political. At school, they required us to listen to both and summarize it. But all we could see on TV uh, was the podium and the men sitting in the front row. We could never see the women. Years later, when I went to the Friday prayers, um, I saw that actually women sat in the back in a totally different section, and their, their section was separated with a curtain. The men could not even see the women. The women were back there 
in clusters, uh, really in a picnic style. The kids played around. And once they had to pray, which was for, again, 10 or 15 minutes after both sermons were over, the sermons usually took about an hour, they stood in, in rows and they said their prayers. Otherwise, um, for a lot of people from the lower classes, as Nisa explained it to us week after week, it was a fun thing to do. So anybody who's seen the show upstairs um, is probably recognizing fervor. Uh, <laughs> Shireen's laughing, I guess, because she recognizes fervor. Um, could you go back to when you made fervor and, and tell us how you kind of conceived and storyboarded it and how much hearing stories about Friday prayers going on in the 90s in Iran informed what became for her? Yeah, I mean, I took um, certain um, important sociological um, issues uh, and then in a very stylized manner, um, I, I made work about it. For example, Turbulent was the, the absence of women in musical industry, how women are basically forbidden to sing in public, I still think is true. And so... And music that, runs through a lot of your other work. Yeah, so, yeah. exactly. And, and so um, in a very conceptual and stylized way, uh, we made a work that really was a commentary on, uh, on that very important sociological reality. But at the same time, um, the work went elsewhere. You know the the female power, the 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 notion of rebellion and re being rebellious, the the strength of the women who always were against the wall, but they always fought and broke the walls, and and it, it really became symbolic of of the power of the woman, the way I saw it, and and with fervor um, because he completed the trilogy um, with rapture and fer uh, and turbulent, uh, I wanted to to capture that sense of taboo, the, 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 the extreme pressure uh, when it comes to that notion of temptation for opposite sex and how women and men have to um, restrain themselves from any public display of, of affections. And I was very um, struck by when I went to Iran at the beginning, right after the revolution, that men and women weren't really making eye contacts, at least the bureaucrats really if you went to the bank or something, they kept con trying to avoid eye contact, and it was just really disturbing. Um, and, and then, um, so it, it really started with this idea of putting a man and a woman uh, near each other where they could feel their proximity, but they, and they felt a certain chemistry, but there was a barrier, and that was the curtain that was. So we took inspiration from the Friday prayers where literally in certain places I saw that there was a curtain, just like in the weddings, actually, in Iranian weddings, they used to have a curtain where the women were on one side or the men on the other side or at the beach where they had these long curtains and I just found these curtains unbelievably provocative um, and, and really uh, visually interesting, geometrically. Um, and, and so we first showed the man and the woman in the open space where they, they encountered each other and had this friction but then they went the separate ways but then they saw each other in a public domain where now they, uh, you know, they, they were aware of each other again but in surrounded by other people. Now the event was um, resembling both a kind of religious ceremony like a Friday prayer but also um, the theatrical, the 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 the, the uh, tazie that we had this um, what they call them passion plays where uh, a man would come and use a painting as a backdrop of a very important story and this was the story of Yusuf and Zuleikha where Zuleikha was blamed for seducing Yusuf and and he was using this backdrop to tell the men and the women to learn from that that came from the Quran and restrain themselves from any form of temptation and is a la'nat bar shaitan you know um was Lanat Bey Shaitan, damn the devil. And so we, we obviously, in the most conceptual way, we used um, the, the, the events of the religious and both cultural, the, the more religious passion play as a setting. And um, it played out like that. And, yeah. and again, the men were in white, the women in black. So it was highly conceptual and stylized. With a dramatic twist at the end. Um, 
so Nazila, in, in your book, it's full of these great little details, you know, where five words kind of explains something that I had seen in Shireen's work but had never found a point of origin for. Um, you had a passage in the book about um, why Iranian men, supporters of the revolution most especially, often wore wrinkled, untucked white, white shirts. Why did they do that? <laughs> well, um, they wanted to show their humble roots. Um, and it was true. I mean, that was one of the biggest differences uh, that you recognized between uh, government bureaucrats under the Shah and a lot of uh, people in the rural areas. And since uh, people who supported the Islamic regime, I want to be clear about this, because there were a lot of people uh, who protested against the Shah, people from various classes, but those who supported Khomeini were mostly from uh, lower classes, much more traditional and uh, religious people. Uh, those were the ones who uh, were very keen to show their humble backgrounds. And so it become uh, quite fashionable among them to walk around in sandals, um, plastic sandals, even at government uh, uh, buildings. And for, for many, it was embarrassing because they didn't look professional. And one of the biggest changes that happened after Khomeini's death um, in, in the, the, from the beginning of the 1990s was, was that these men started dressing up. Uh, and that's when we realized that they had evolved, um, that they had changed. It was first the dress. Uh, a lot of things uh, in the beginning of the revolution was about symbols. Uh, I mean, men wore wrinkled shirts. They wore their shirts over their pants, untucked, uh, no neckties. Whoever wore the necktie was a sign that they supported the Shah. Uh, or they were Western. Uh, and in, in addition to that, women. Women became the walking symbols of, of the regime. They were forced to cover their hair, to wear black, long coats. Uh, and again, since the 1990s, the change came through symbols. Uh, women started wearing color. Women started showing more hair. And the same men who wore in plastic sandals started wearing proper shoes, laced shoes, uh, nice suits. Uh, they pressed their shirts. They shaved their beards. Um, and that's when we started feeling that things were changing in very serious ways. Shireen, how did you conceptualize how you would attire men particularly um, in your work? Not just the works upstairs, but kind of moving through from the late 90s into the 2000s. Um, actually, um, intuitively, <laughs> I guess I took inspiration uh, in a way that I saw the men right after the revolution, how they dressed. Most of the men that I photographed were with button-up shirts, white, white shirts. Um, they were almost like uniform. Um, and um, I, I didn't really analyze it at the time, but I was also very struck when I first went back in, in the particular look that these conservative religious men had that sort of characterized what they stood for. And, and very often on the street level, you could kind of guess people's politics by the way they dressed, which is hard to do. I mean, I guess you could do that anywhere. Uh, usually it means the class of the person, how wealthy they are or not. But in that case, it was more about the the values and the re and, and the where they stood politically, and I found that very interesting um, methodology in my work. And then the woman became veiled, and then suddenly when they're unveiled, uh, and, and uh, you know, my latest photographs, for example, they're unveiled. So um, they're extremely important for me because my work is very minimal, and there is not much, you know, um, but, but those subtleties um, are really thought after, you know, I, I really thought about them a lot. But the earlier photographs of women of Allah, I actually photographed some men, including Kiana Taj Baksh, who ended up being in prison a number of times. Um, he was um, a subject of my work, and ironically, I put a white shirt with a button up. Uh, he, for some of you who don't know who Kion is, he uh, went back to Iran and was accused of being a spy for 
um, Soros and and etc. And he's had a nightmare of a life in Iran ever since. Um, but so yeah, I I I was always more like through journalism, through the photos, uh, my first trips to Iran, but images that I saw that inspired me and sort of mobilized me to create the images that I did. So upstairs we see photographs from your own collection and AP photographs and, and, and news photographs. Um, you're mining them for, for visual information the same way an historian would. Exactly. I remember the first book that really impacted me was a book called The Warrior Woman, The Warrior Woman of Allah, something like that. And the cover, and I think that book is actually upstairs. And I started to collect a series of newspapers that were published all over the world. Uh, a woman voluntarily being armed um, and and sent to to war during the Iran and Iraq war. And I found this completely ironic. Some of the women had flowers on their, you know, their weapon, and, but yet they were armed with, I just, I just found that whole militancy of women do, right after the revolution and before, uh, just a phenomenon, uh, such a contradiction in terms of, of what um, the revolution was, um, you know, how it was treating the woman at the same time how some of the women were, you know, voluntarily being armed. So anyway, um, yeah, those images were what provoked me to create those. One of the fun parts about your book, Nazela, is, um, so it's a memoir, but kind of um, every 20 pages, there's a crescendo point at which you get interrogated. Um, so it, it kind of takes on this spy thriller element <laughs> that is kind of very, as you read it, you're kind of not sure what's going to happen. Um, could you describe um, one or two of those experiences and maybe explain how those interrogations or questionings by government officials, sometimes in government buildings, sometimes in abandoned apartment buildings, um, served the regime and kind of what they were hoping to get out of it other than just letting you know that, you know, someone was aware? Well, um, I'm glad there was something fun in the book. <laughs> a lot of fun in the book. Um, that's a hard one. Um, you know, I, I have to say, um, the interrogations were horrifying. They were very um, scary. Uh, the first time I was uh, summoned um, to go to the intelligence ministry to the official building, I was terrified. But I think growing up in Iran, um, growing up as a woman in Iran, had prepared me for this. Um, you know, as, um, as I went to school after the revolution, uh, our lives changed. Um, we had to wear a headscarf, we had to wear a certain kind of coats, we had to wear certain colors. There were many things that we couldn't do anymore. And all along, all these years, we were constantly punished. And for some reason, uh, we decided right from the beginning that we were not going to give in. We were not going to surrender. So it became a battle. And uh, I constantly defied the rules. I was not alone. All the girls my generation did that. I didn't know a single girl in my school who embraced the restrictions and the, the, the rules. Um, and I guess this prepared me or somehow um, put me in a position uh, to, to deal with what came up afterwards as well. When I started working as a translator for foreign reporters who had just started visiting Iran after Khomeini's death, I was very aware that I was doing a very risky job. I, I knew that if I got into trouble, if I, if I was picked up, I, I could be accused of spying. But I did it, and now I, when I look back, and I think the only thing that prepared me for that was the fact that we started taking risks from a very early age. I mean, we had a swimming pool in our housing complex where I lived. I was just nine years old at the time of the revolution, and suddenly I was banned from swimming there. All the girls were banned from swimming in an outdoor pool. You did it once anyway. We, we did. We swam in the pool. Even if it was for a few minutes, we would jump, we would swim, get out, and run home. I was never caught. We were not <laughs> allowed to uh, listen to Western music. I recorded uh, tapes, took them to school, smuggled them to school, and shared them with my friends. I was never caught. 
Um, so, you know, I... Sometimes the, the men who brought the tapes, the couriers, were caught, though. Yes. I mean, people were caught all the time, but the fact that I was never caught, I, I took the risk, maybe gave me the courage to do riskier things, and working with foreign reporters was one of those things. So when finally, about a year and a half after I had secretly started working with reporters, I got a call from the Ministry of Intelligence summoning me to the ministry, I was very terrified. Fortunately, that was in the 1990s after Khomeini had died. And it was at a time when the country was uh, opening up. And um, I felt right after that first meeting, uh, they were playing good cop, bad cop. The bad cop was very scary. The good cop was somehow reassuring. And I got the feeling that there was something I was doing that was beneficiary to these guys that allowed me to um, encourage me to, to keep on doing what I was doing. But every time I went there, the, the environment was very intimidating. I was put in a room for a long time to wait. And uh, I was always reminded um, of, of movies where there is an interrogation and you see somebody sitting in an empty room um, alone um, in a, under a dim light. And uh, it, it provides you with the time to fear what's coming. And so the time that I sat there and I waited and waited for my interrogators to come was even uh, scarier than when they came in because when the conversation was going on, at least I was somehow engaged. But they always gave me the sense that I was being watched, that my friends who were doing the same thing and were being summoned were speaking against me. They wanted pro to provoke a sense in me that I should not trust any of my friends. And um, I was very aware of that. Um, and the entire time that I worked in Iran, I always felt that I was being watched. Whether I was being watched or not, I don't know. I might never know, but that was the sense that these guys gave me. So, Shireen, you've made two pieces that use interrogations as their way, official state, or what, what are, you know, readable to the viewer as official state interrogations of an individual or individuals um, as kind of the thing the artwork is built around. Um, the first one was The Last Word from 2003, which is um, one of my two favorite things you've ever done. Um, it was exhibited here in Washington in 2010 at Irvine Contemporary. Um, and the other one is Overruled, which is from a couple years ago. Um, the last word uses um, an official interrogation as an opportunity to detail the importance and role of creative individuals, poets, artists, um, in, in uh, a complicated or closed society. Um, and Overruled looks at the possibilities of differing interpretations and approaches to religion. Why? Um, was the setup of an interrogation something that was so appealing to you, you didn't just do it once, you did it twice? Well, first of all, I think living in America, we take our freedom for granted, for sure. Um, I um, have had an obsession with reading prison memoirs. Uh, I have to say, someone who's here, Hales van der who's extraordinary uh, memoir this summer. I was just couldn't put it down. Shanush Parsipur, um, the, the lovely writer who, whose book, Woman Without Men, I turned into a movie, wrote an amazing prison memoir. I, I, you haven't been in prison, but your memoir. I, I've had two people who I work closely that each have been in prison for three, four years, have told me extensively about their time in prison. And I myself, that piece that you're talking about was, um, you know, again, I consider myself like an American who's never really had this kind of uh, prob problem with authority, but I was exiting Iran. I mean, it's nothing comparing to what Iranians in Iran experience, but I remember that my son was only three, four years old, and, um, and I came to the air airport and my family left, and you go through, you know, seven gates to get out of Tehran. And I had no, I had just shot some new photographs there. I never worked before in Iran, but I actually did for the first time. So I had all the contact sheets. And when I got there, the man, uh, yeah, he told me to go to this other room. And uh, I, I was there for a few hours. Uh, and, and I think 
I have never been more mortified than this experience ever in my whole life. A few the, hours is a long time. Uh, the idea that your freedom, it's, you know, it's no longer in your own hand. And I remember my son was very young and he was sleeping and, and this man said to me, you're never leaving. You basically forget it. You're going to the court. And, and I kept saying, but why? I've been here every time and I've never had any problem. To make the story short, um, it was really terrifying. And eventually, he threw the passport at my face, uh, and I just ran to the airplane. Later, I found out there was actually another Shirin Nashat they were looking for, <laughs> who happened to have the same birthday and the same father's name, whatever. But I thought I, I was important enough as an artist. It was actually not me at all. <laughs> they had no interest in Shirin Nashat, the artist. But for years after, they mixed me and her together. Um, because her father was a general and they had executed him and she had started a movement against the government named Shirin Najat Same. So to this day, um, much of the government thinks I am that Shirin Najat. But now they also have a problem with me, of course. But, but, but that experience, I mean, what she's speaking of, again, my experience is like minus zero compared to so many thousands of people. But nevertheless, it left me an impression and, and the fact that I was never able to return to Iran because of that experience. I was horrified. And I, I, the idea of giving my freedom away and taking that risk, the risk that she had taken as a young person, I'd never taken because I lived in Iran during the time that there was a certain amount of freedom. And, and we never had, I mean, we had Sawak, the secret police. I remember there were certain things we didn't talk about, but not to this extent, you know. And, and so I was really spoiled as an Iranian who left Iran during the revolution. I never saw anything like that. And here I was visiting, and there it, it hit me. It hit me really hard. And, and suddenly, when I came back to America and I gave my passport, the guy said, well, you know, an African-American told me, welcome home. I just started to cry because I realized that I had completely taken, you know, you know, um, for granted what this country had given me and, and what all the Iranian people didn't have. And yet they had gotten custom to it and they, I admire them for that. And, and I think they're heroic in my mind in how they have uh, dealt with day-to-day -day, um, oppression. And, and that uh, became a focus of my work in many ways, I think. And so, yes, yeah, some of the work was uh, really not just about my experience, but the Iranian people's experience, particularly Iranian woman. Did you read about other people being interrogated? And, and, and was that a, a, a point of departure? Was it entirely your own experience? How did? Um, again, my generation was the generation who brought the Islamic Revolution. And most of the people who um, I had grown up with eventually became activists, or some of them died, some of them fled. Uh, so when I went back to Iran, uh, I, I ran I went back to visiting them again, those who still were in Iran, and they described their experiences. And, and a lot of the Iranian people I worked with, um, really almost like 80% of them were political activists. And they had been tortured, they had been in prison, um, their husbands were or wives were executed. I, I, I can just not tell you enough about uh, how much of my generation this was their reality. Even if they lived outside, they had fled and they were refugees or people like me who couldn't go back but didn't have a really terrible experience. Um, so it's the story of our generation. Nazila's uh, generation was one that um, was born after the revolution or, 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 or uh, one that um, had little experience of the Shah's period and, uh, and you know, it's a very different uh, experience. Um, yeah. So I want to ask about, I'm going to ask about one more area, um, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So be thinking of them. Uh, we'll have somebody with a microphone. Um, so please, when we get there, wait for that. Um, so Nazila, one of the other parts of your book that jumped out at me was your occasional discourses on feminism. Could you describe how much Western feminism got to Iran, how impactful it was, and then how much um, nativist feminism was there and is there in Iran? 
A lot of feminists, uh, Western feminism had got into Iran already before the 1979 revolution. A lot of women had gone overseas, studied, and once they came back, they brought with them a lot of uh, those notions. But I think what changed Iran in the past 35 years are those militant women, the ones who held their weapons with a rose in, uh, on them. Uh, women like Nessa's daughter, um, who were given apartments. Uh, Nessa's daughter went to university. I mean, she hadn't even uh, uh, graduated from high school when she became the principal um, of a school. But after that, she went to university. Um, it, it, that's, the, I think, the biggest change that happened after the revolution. When Khomeini came to power, she realized, he realized that he could not count um, on the middle class Iranians. If they had supported the revolution, uh, they had not supported the Islamic government. They, they, most of them were leftists, they were socialists. They wanted the Shah to go, but they wanted democracy. So he started looking at lower classes, people from the rural areas, and, and he said to them that he needed them and he needed their wives, he needed their women to, they all needed to, uh, help uh, the revolution, serve the revolution. Uh, he encouraged them to go to school. He encouraged them to take jobs at the civil sector. The civil sector doubled right after the revolution, and a lot of these women uh, were hired. They came in their head to toe chadors, the same chadors that are depicted in Shirin's work. Uh, they were there not only to do a lot of work, but also to police the rest of society, to police People like my mother, to police us, they came to our schools at what we call the morality teachers. Uh, they came to teach us the ideology of the revolution. And that was a big, big population. And as they entered society, they left their homes, they left uh, the, the places where they would have traditionally become mothers, worked on the farm, uh, worked in the cottage industry, but would have never become part of city life uh, they went to university very much like city, uh, Nessa's daughter, uh, a lot of morality teachers in my school. They, they studied, they got their PhDs, and, and I witnessed their metamorphosis. Uh, in the early days after the revolution, uh, we were not allowed to do anything that involved beautifying ourselves. They took down the mirrors in the bathrooms because we were not supposed to look at ourselves. But by the time I was in high school, a lot of these women were wearing contact lenses, they were bracing, wearing braces on their teeth, they were beautifying themselves. And, and they had changed, and by early 1990s, they became what we called Islamist feminists. And uh, by that time, they had felt um, the, the cruelty of the Islamic law. They had realized that their husbands could divorce them whenever he wanted, whenever a husband wanted. He would get the custody of the children. Some of them had lost their husbands in the war. And according to the Islamic law, the paternal grandfather had the right to take the children away. So these women had lost their husbands and they were losing their children too. And by 1990s, a lot of them were educated women. They teamed up with secular women from before the revolution. One of them was a woman who started uh, publishing a, a one of the most serious fem feminist magazines in the country. And they started writing um, articles demanding the, the laws to change. Um, a lot of these religious women went to the uh, uh, religious city of Rome, which is like the Vatican for Shiites, knocked on the doors of the clerics and started asking them to reinterpret the, the Islamic law. They argued that uh, this is a different time than the time of Prophet Muhammad. Women were educated, they were working. They were contributing to the household economy. So the value of a woman's life should be equal to the value of a man's life. A lot of those laws have not changed, but uh, there's no doubt that Iranian society is much more ahead uh, than, than Iranian laws. It is the Iranian laws that is backward. And it was that process that turned women into such a force. Uh, they were a big force in 1997 when they brought the reformist president uh, to power. And in, 19, in 2009, uh, in, a lot, in a lot of photos that are also in the show, women are at the forefront of the demonstrations. And I have no doubt that uh, women are a force of change and they are changing this country in very profound ways. How much of it is Western? 
how, how much of it is homogen is is homegrown. It is really hard to tell because um, a lot of these women were women who were very religious, and uh, in, in those early uh, years when they they started uh, fighting for more rights for women, if you call them feminist, it was as if you were calling them. Uh, uh, communists. I mean, it was it, they were two equal terms to them. They found it insulting, and they always said that they were Iranian, they were Muslim, whatever they wanted had roots in the indigenous culture. Uh, but of course, I mean, when you talk about equal rights with men, a lot of it can be Western. So, Shireen, as you think back over your oeuvre, are you able to point to specific things in, in, in works and go, oh, that's a product of Western feminist thought and influence, and that is a product of Iranian homegrown feminism? Are you able to find one and the other, or does it all blur? I mean, my problem with Western feminism, and that's the reason I've had more of an affinity with uh, an idea of Iranian sense of feminism is that I always felt like Western feminism is has been always about equality between men versus women or 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 women competing with men where in reality I think in the Middle East at least what I identify with is this idea that you know women don't want to be like men women want to be like themselves but the, they want to have equal rights you know and and so I I I, I feel like Western feminism, a lot of feminists become very manly, very masculine, even in their looks. Uh, and they almost feel like in order to be taken seriously, they, they have to be masculinized, you know. Uh, where I, I think the Iranian example, for example, is, is, is a good one in a way that women really fight to, be, to remain women, but still they're very rebellious and very defiant. And I think the green movement, you saw um, how that represented everything. You know, you saw how women were up there with the men and now, you know, you know fighting against the government. So, I mean, for me, um, my work, I guess, has been exclusively a commentary about an Eastern idea of feminism, more exclusively Iranian, uh, and that sense of courage and bravery under oppression. Um, and, and, and perhaps because in, in this part of the world, I mean, I have to be very honest, something that is really fresh in my mind. Before I came here, I was watching CNN. I thank God I don't have TV. And I, I, and I saw Trump, Donald Trump, and, and, and I thought that's a frightening man. I, and I honestly, I, I think this country has to rebel against such a right-wing human being. He is, to me, as frightening as Khomeini. I mean, we're scared. Uh, I mean, I, and I, I, I was really, I, I was frightened by what he says. Like, what comes out of his mouth and the fact that he's nominated as a potential president, it's frightening. I think this country has to, like, immediately take this seriously, you know, and nothing is more horrifying than this man, the prospect of this man ruling America, and the way he speaks about Iran of today, he was talking about, oh my God, but the, the immigration, the, the world, his knowledge, his stupidity, and I kept thinking, what is different between him and some from the ISIS? I mean, he breathes hatred, violence, he tries to sabotage everything that is about negotiation, it's about diplomacy. How could American people even begin to think about this? And now if this happened in Iran, I mean, I wonder, I mean, I just wonder why Americans don't become more of activists than Iranians have become. I mean, I, I have to say I stand right in the middle of these two nations. And I have to say I, I am shocked and dumbfounded by the possibility the possibility that this country will do that. And in one minute, you're looking at images of refugees from Syria and people pleading for Americans to help them and how, in fact, part of the reason there are refugees because of what the American diplomacy uh, politics. And then on the other hand, you have 
this man coming in front of, I don't know, I think he was in Washington today, to, to sabotage the, the negotiation with, uh, with Iran. And, and I, I was so frightened with the images of the refugees from Syria um, desperately to get out of there. And then looking at him, and I thought, we're living in a horrible time, really, honestly. And this is not just about Iran and us feeling sorry about Iranian government and its politics. I'm sorry. This country, we got a lot of problems. And, 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 and so when we're speaking about Iran, and I'm just coming back to, you know, very often I, I feel very conflicted because we're reminding the Americans about how horrible the situation is in Iran. It's true. It really is. But it's, this country's also got its problems. And I, I just don't want us to, to leave this room thinking that, you know, we, you know, we are this, you know, perfect country. And, and in fact, a lot of this in, are inflicted from the West. And, and so I'm, I'm having very mixed feelings going on and on and on about, you know, how women are, the, you know, my work is all about, you know, it's, it's really, it bothers me. And I had to say that because I came from my hotel watching Sienna. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, there's... <laughs> there's... There's certainly an element of the American body politic that condemns absolutism abroad while endorsing it at home. Um, so, let's open it up for questions. <laughs> let's open um, it to the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> please raise your hand, and we'll, we will steer a microphone towards you. And I guess we're going to start uh, back in the middle, it looks like. So my question is for Ms. Nishat. Um, you talk about how a lot of your work comes from your personal experience as a woman. And um, I'm struck by some of the imagery of children with their mothers in your work. And I was wondering if you could speak about how motherhood um, informs your work and fits in with the general themes of um, the, the broader context of your work as well. Yeah, I mean, of course, this evening, uh, the subject, the conversation is really dominated by us two people as Iranians and, you know, being in exile and a political reality. But the truth is that a lot of my work is my own personal battle between what goes on inside of me and the outside world, the inner and the outer um, you know, reality, and um, much of it has to do with Iran, much of it has nothing to do with Iran. Um, of course, uh, I am a mother, and I, I have um, raised my son as a single mother since he was very young, and, um, you know, I he's Korean, Iranian, raised in this country, um, and and much of the women that I've been, for example, Shahnur Shapar Sipur, also had a son who uh, had to be taken away from her because of her term in prison and la later because of mental illness, etc. Furukh Farukh Sad, another poet that I'm obsessed with, uh, also had a son who was taken away from her um, because of her choice of following her career, her art. Um, I am very um, emotionally invested in women who choose to have a career um, and choose to be an individual, but not a nuclear family situation. Um, I'm making a film about Oma Kulsum, who's never been a mother, but had a, actually adopted a, a son. Um, and, and, and I think that does relate to being Middle Easterner uh, and how when you choose a career, you basically have to abandon um, a normal traditional life and so the life that I lived and the life that I gave to my son was definitely not traditional. And I struggled emotionally being an artist and being a mother and giving him a life that is not really possible to be rooted as an Iranian or American or Korean um, because I was not with my family and he didn't experience traditional ceremonial life of Iranian culture and yet he wasn't with his father to celebrate the Korean culture and yet he wasn't all American. So, you know, this kind of hybrid reality, this kind of nomadic life that I have lived, I have given to my son. And, and to me, this was really 
an interesting point of my life. And, and this is why I curiously followed other women artists, and particularly Iranian women who had to leave with their children or abandon their children or have sacrificed, you know, their romantic and family life because of the life they chose, you know. And, and so this has been something that I've projected into my work in my photographs, uh, where actually my son was in the photographs that you see above, uh, upstairs. Uh, so, yeah, that's really, uh, I think, yeah. Over here, this is for Shireen. I was just wondering what your motivation was for becoming an artist and how you had the self-confidence to do that. I wonder myself, actually, uh, very often. Um, and, and I think, um, like many artists, uh, I had a romantic fascination with being an artist. Uh, it, uh, for us in Iran, when we grew up, uh, being an artist was being an entertainer, really. It, it wasn't taken very seriously, at least not in my generation. Uh, and, and I remember when I came to UC Berkeley uh, as a young, immature artist, um, uh, my work was extremely simplistic, and uh, I was just trying to find myself, and I, I, I was smart enough at some point to, find, um, to discover that I had really nothing to say, and that I think there is nothing worse than mediocrity and, and, and work of art that basically is career driven and, and without any substance. And so I, I abandoned art um, for about 10 years. And my return to art, and to this day I could faithfully say that um, uh, for me, art has become um, a, a life transforming experience. I, I find that um, there's no possibility for me to separate who I am from my art and, and my lifestyle as a human being and the work. I don't go to studio to make art and then go home and be someone else. Uh, I am my art and my art is myself and the subject matter and the experiences. Uh, and, I, and my interpretation and my communication with the people um, is what I really feel inside. And, and I think that at the same time, it's not autobiographical. Um, my work, it's not intending to be autobiographical. And, and so I believe in, in art strongly as a form of communication and, and, and strongly as, as, as a culture in general, as a way of um, transformation for, I mean, as an alternative to politics, as an alternative to mobilizing, provoking, and inspiring people. So I believe in art as something extremely serious. Um, I remember, if I could say at the last, as a last uh, note to this question, that I met a filmmaker uh, when I started to study film, and he gave me a list of films to see, and then he said, please, I advise you, write down the date and the hour that you saw these films, because you will never be the same person after you see these films. And I, I really didn't take it seriously, but I really now I can say with confidence that when I saw certain masterpieces like by Tarkovsky or Kiarostami or certain Kurosawa or even great work of art, I was never the same again. And that's how powerful I think art can be. It's very difficult to make work that is on that level. I certainly haven't make that, made that kind of work myself, but I really believe that, yeah, art can be quite transformative. Sorry to go on. Uh, Rebecca Solnit says that artists are the people freest, uh, people in any society freest to ask the biggest questions, which I think um, is a good definition. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm intrigued by your uh, point about the artist and the role of communication, especially with political ideas and the value of human life relative to other lives, um, which is really interesting. And I was wondering if you could comment on um, the uh, Bring Back Our Girls campaign, for example, in Nigeria, and about you know the value of these lives that are discounted relative to others and um, the potential for artists to speak more clearly and to remind society and communities at large about um, the value of lives. And I'm, I'm really moved by your piece in Turbulent, for example. I think it is so striking about um, the value, the voice of women, and how it's heard or not heard. And it helps us recognize in our society these things. 
Um, it's extremely tricky, uh, and I was thinking today, um, actually the images of the refugees are just so disturbing, and I kept thinking about Nazila, and how in many ways I feel like I'm so irrelevant when you think about the work that she has done, journalists who are really able to report on reality in such a uh, strong way, and people like me who are always making fictions. And, and I kept looking at these images of these poor refugees, and I, I, I was in tears, and I kept thinking, what can I do? And really, what could you do? And I kept thinking, but you know, you make work that it somehow provokes people to think about it. But the truth is that it's very, very difficult to make successful art in a way that is really not just didactic or propaganda or one-liner um, that sort of just promotes one idea that already people know and most of us here obviously uh, are people who want to be helpful and, and, and are anti-tyranny, uh, etc. So what could a work of art do that is not preaching to the converter? You know, what kind of profundity what kind of note can we leave people that 100 years from now people could look and say, wow, you know, that it could report in a way that something that is very timeful couldn't. It's very difficult to walk that balance. And even for the work that I have done, I have many critics on my back to, that really like to, to really destroy me for the fact that my work comes such close proximity to socio-political historical issues. They say this is not art and she's trying to be controversial, sensational. She's using these ideas to, to advance herself. So imagine if I made work about what the subjects that you just talked about, you know, they would immediately reduce it not to art. This is, this is no longer taken seriously as a work of art, particularly in the Western world, but more like a reportage or documentary, you know? And, and, and so this is the balance of making work that is at the same time a very substantial and, and important work of art and yet has a profound message, humanitarian message, it's extremely difficult. And I sometimes envy people who are journalists who can be so bold and just report because to me, documentary is just as valid as fiction. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, on this note, to go back to Nazila, um, you know, I think, again, you bring two people here, two women who are equally invested in humanitarian issues, particularly women issues. But one does it through fiction, and one does it through... I mean, how do you see this as a role of artist as opposed to a writer? And is it easier to be a journalist and uncovering truths as opposed to um, finding and creating narratives out of them? I, I think it's easier to be a journalist <laughs> because you have... To, I mean, the creativity that you use to... to you, you call it fiction... Uh, I don't want to even call fictionalized because it is based on a lot of reality. But it requires a lot of creativity to turn um, uh, those um, quite um, uh, cruel images, uh, stories, um, into, into pieces that are artistically appealing to people. I have to say sometimes, not just in my work, but I've been publicly outspoken. Um, during the Green Movement and other times, but I find this also very difficult um, because I find as an artist I shouldn't be speaking, I should make art. And then, uh, you know, yet I find myself like in Davos in the World Economic Forum, I had to give a three minute appeal because there were all the heads of the states and see, what, do you, gee, what do you call this corporate people? And, and in three minutes I had to address people who had not a clue about art, who I was, had never seen my work but to had to appeal to them the importance of culture in, in, in relation to politics and our artists as agents of, of diplomacy and, 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 um, and that the artists are basically speaking the mind of the people and they are not biased and they don't have agendas where 
politicians do. So I tried to articulate, but then I regret it because soon later you, you become this ambassador or the speak. I, I don't find myself very comfortable. The other day I posted something supporting an organization from Saudi Arabia that supported this, this thing about um, the, against breast um, cancer. Uh, and, and this woman who really has become an incredible initiative trying to educate people in Saudi Arabia, women, to take care because they don't go to the doctors. And then this Iranian uh, people in the social media attack me. Oh, how about Iran? Why are you supporting something in Saudi Arabia? Like, why are you like doing a film about Omicos? So in other words, you know, it's, it's also once you become public in your support of certain things, then you have no idea what comes your way. So. It's an incredibly tedious um, place to walk in a way that you, you're articulate, that you're balanced, and you're making significant voice, but that your work is not just purely a propaganda. And that's, it's, yeah, it's difficult, but I'm trying. Well, uh, last question. I'm a volunteer here. I serve at the information desk in the lobby. And I wanted to share with you my experience in interacting with the visitors before and after they've seen the exhibition. I've lost track of the number of people who've come to the desk afterwards, mostly women, to share with me how moved they were by the exhibition. Just this week I had a woman who stood quietly, told me she couldn't find the words to express um, her, her emotions after visiting with your work. Finally, she simply started to cry and said that she was leaving not the same person as she was when she came in. Thank you, Rissa. And now my question, there's a young woman artist. Um, I understand that she has a 12-year prison sentence in Iran. She's a cartoonist. And that her prison sentence may be extended because of the indecency laws. She shook her lawyer's hand. If you could tell us a little bit about what you know about her prospects. I didn't know that her um, sentence might be extended, but that's horrifying because 12 years is already a long time. Um, uh, most activists got uh, prison terms of five years, eight years, 12 years is extremely long. And that shows how terrified the regime is of women. Because most women activists got longer sentences than men. And there are many women in prison now. Um, I don't know where she shook the lawyer's hand. Uh, I had not heard about it, but if she did it in, in prison or in court, she was probably making a statement because um, you wouldn't do that. Uh, that's, that's considered a big crime. Shireen Nishat, Nazila Fadi, thanks very much for coming. Thank you.